This section will basically breeze over most of the different points of TheaRender and covers briefly what all the other sections cover, but in a much more brief manner. To really get specific and learn more in depth about TheaRender, I do recommend going and watching the other sections, but if someone wants to just learn the functions really quick on how to basically navigate through here, this is probably the best section to look at. So first, let's look at one of the things that can be scary, which is if we close one of these windows. This can be scary because we're like, how do we get them back? Where did they go? To get the top bar back, click here. To get the bottom bar back, go here. To get the windows back, go to window, and we can click and get back all the different windows this way. There's also another window that's normally closed when we start up the render. Click on that, it opens the texture lab where we can combine different textures in many different ways. We even have a couple procedural textures that we can use. I'll close that for now because we'll do more in depth into that later. Next, I want to show if we go up here to help, open, user manual, we actually get the user manual in PDF form for TheaRender. It comes with the installation of TheaRender and has a bunch of helpful information to help us with TheaRender. Another thing over here is the theme. We can click on that, change the color. Render is more in depth to use this functionality and file. We can open merge, save scenes, and open example scenes that should come with the installation of TheaRender. These example scenes are really great to look at and study. If we look at the different materials set up on them and the way the lighting is set up, it's a great educational tool just looking through these different scenes. The scene I like using a lot is this one because this gives a really great material preview for a bunch of different materials when we're trying to make new materials. Now that we have this open, to make it look different, we can click and get different ways to display it in the viewport. I like to use solid because it gives the most realistic rendition of what it looks like after it's rendered. But to make it look even more like what it's going to look like when it's actually rendered, we can go over here to tools and click on interactive render. This interactive render toolbar was actually here when we first started up the render but this is how to get it back. If we also look over here, we got the transformation tool to see the exact position and scale of any object in the scene. If we click on bitmap coordinates, we can change the texture projection if the object actually has a texture projection on it. And we have animation, which we can use to set keyframes of any objects in the scene. Over here with the interactive render, to start it up, click this button. It should start up momentarily. The more complex the scene, the longer it will take to start up. Now that it's going and it's started up, we can rotate it and it will instantly start to render the scene again, which is why it's called an interactive render. And if we click over here, we don't even go back to the other viewport we stay within the interactive render as we rotate and manipulate this object around, which is really cool. To stop the interactive render, click here again and click on stop. Next, another thing that might happen is we can click down here and this might look like it messes up the viewport. Fix this. We can go over here, click on the camera that we want to be looking through that was there originally, then click on go to selected camera view, and that should get us back to the original camera view. The other way to do it, we can go over here to camera, middle click on it, and that'll also get us back to this camera's original viewport. Some other tools down here are also for the camera and some more viewport options. Over here, we can select an object, and zoom up on it or center it in the view. This other option will only center the object without changing how far we're zoomed up on it. And again, back to the regular camera view. Next thing that we might accidentally click on that could be confusing is over here, if we click on hide, 
we'll be questioning where is our stuff going, how do we get it back. Click on the show all objects, it should get stuff back. If we accidentally click on something, move it to get it back to its old position, we can click undo. Then we also have the options of rotating and scaling up here as well. So if we accidentally scale something to a different size, undo, it will get back to its previous size. There are also layers in Theater Render. We can turn them on and off right here. So if we don't see our objects because they're on a different layer, we can click here on the different layer and turn them on and off that way. If we click on this little arrow, we got a bunch of lights, an infinite plane that we can insert, and a camera. Over here, we'll go through these options in a different section and these tools we've already gone through. Over here on the other side, we got some options for rotating, scaling, dollying, and focus, which we get into more in a different section. But for rotating, panning, and dollying, there are actually some shortcut keys that we can use. So we don't have to go up here and switch tools. Those keyboard shortcuts are middle clicking for rotating, scroll wheel for zooming in and out, and right clicking for panning around the scene. We can also hold down Alt and this will make the panning, rotating, and zooming exactly like it is in many 3D programs, which is Alt and left click to rotate, Alt and middle click to pan, and Alt and right click to zoom in and out. And if we notice here, the zooming is really, really smooth when we do it this way, or with the mouse wheel, it jumps a little bit. So if we want to zoom in really smoothly, we can use this option. Another thing that might happen is we click on something, delete it by clicking on the little trash can. We can click undo to get them back. Over here is the material lab with a bunch of different material settings that we can play with. Mostly for most textures, we just use the basic material. I wouldn't really worry about the rest until the actual tutorial has gone through where we cover all the different materials. Next is environment where we can actually enable physical sky. And if we notice when physical sky has been enabled, the image-based lighting has automatically been turned off. So we turn this on, we can see what happens, and we notice that a sun has also been added to our scene. So if we click on the sun, we get this popping up where we can adjust where the sun is shining in our scene. Next, we have render options. We have biased and unbiased in Theo Render. In Biased, we can make really, really fast, high-quality renders. With Unbiased, we get the best super-quality renders of pretty much any render engine anywhere. Only when we have this set to Biased do we use the settings here. If we have this set to either Unbiased options, the settings in these two tabs will do absolutely nothing. Also notice that when we're in Biased mode, we have these things blacked out. If we ever set something to a certain mode where we get things blacked out, that means those settings will do absolutely nothing because of the current mode we're in. So right now these are blacked out. If we change them, it will do nothing to the final biased render. If we switch it to TR1, we notice that these settings become available. Generally, TR1 is better for most scenes, including indoor scenes where it's only lit from light coming through a window, but in certain situations where we have a glass transparent material, a subsurface scattering material, or something like that where the light path can be fairly complicated, or in scenes where we have a very small light source or light coming through very small openings, TR2 can be quicker to fully resolve the image to the point of not having any more visible artifacts. Next, over here on the far tab, we have animation where we can set the frames that will be rendered. And under tools here, we can do instancing, which is really great if we want to have grass, each individual strand on a carpet, 
we want to do a bunch of trees and a huge forest with a bunch of plants. We can use this instance scene to make all the instances for the entire forest and the trees and the grass, and it will look really, really cool. To apply a different material to the object, we can go down here, click on any one of these, and then drag it up, apply it in our scene, and it will be applied. This is also a good time to mention that everything in Theorender should be set to scale. If it's not to scale, it might look really, really funny. So make sure everything is to scale when rendering. To help with the scale in Theorender, we can go to Tools, Transformation, and kind of see how big it is here. And we know what unit we're in by clicking here. We can see what kind of unit we're in currently. To save the scene, go up here to File, Save As. Here we pick where we want to save it, and there are two ways mainly to save it. One is a Thea scene file. With a Thea scene file, it will save the geometry and remember what materials is on what. But if we want to transfer the file to another computer with all the textures and images and materials and environment maps, whatever we have in the scene, we can save it as a Thea pack file and it will save everything in one nice pack that we can load up on any computer and have everything pop up and show correctly, including textures, images, and everything. That's the basics of how to use Thea Render, but I do highly recommend going and looking at the other tutorials because Thea Render is a very in-depth rendering engine with a lot of details that can help make the scene look a lot, lot better. So I hope you enjoy using Thea Render, and I'll see you in the next section. Happy rendering!